So today we're going to do something a little different. Uh, we've done a variation on this uh, in times past. I did a version of this on um, oh, maybe about six weeks ago with uh, the Ten Commandments. Basically, I'm going to make you do a lot of work today. Uh, so the reason I wanted kids in here partly was to experience the, a very different kind of communion that we're going to do. Now you can go ahead and bring up my first slide, uh, Gordon. That'd be great. Uh, we're going to be talking about these three things. Sweet water, the U-turn, and about four and a half. Sweet water, the U-turn, and about four and a half. And I'm going to take you through each movement of these uh, stories of Thanksgiving. And I'm going to make you guys do some table talk. So parents, here's what I want you to show your kids. I want you to show your kids that you can engage in table talk. <laughs> that you can answer questions thoughtfully. Because that teaches them that they can answer questions thoughtfully. So they're not hard questions. And I'm not going to give you, you know, tons of time to do it. So... Uh, it's not hard to do, and you can keep it as surfacey as you like, uh, but it will take you to a different space, and that's what I'm shooting for today. So we're going to walk through some stories. We have a different kind of communion today that uh, uh, the Corleys and uh, Parker helped me out with today, which I'll explain uh, when we get there because they have a very unusual shape. Um, the first one has to do uh, with the cup. And so if you would, just take it. You're not going to drink it just yet. So I just want you to smell it. So make sure everybody's got one in front of them. It should smell good. Am I right? Don't drink it yet. Just smell it. Okay. Then put it down. I want you to smell it. And actually, if you came in the sanctuary early-ish, uh, it should have smelled like Mediterranean lavender in here. Can you smell that a little bit? It should still sort of be in the air. We can spray some right at you if you want. <laughs> and I wanted you to smell that because uh, that takes you to the experience that we catch up with with Jesus. And the next slide. So one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there. She was a prostitute, by the way. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. So let me just describe a couple things here for you right away. First of all, we're at a Pharisee's house, which is a religious official. It's like a pastor's house if you're a kid and don't know what a Pharisee is. Very religious person. You're supposed to watch your mouth when you're at the pastor's house. <laughs> at least people think they should. And so this woman came in, and she has been, uh, had a tough life. Um, she's got thrown into a kind of life that she didn't want, and she was kind of stuck with it and had to stay with it. It wasn't really an option for her. So she stuck with it, made the best of it, which is very difficult to do, and ended up uh, coming into some money, which is what that alabaster jar filled with perfume is about. Now, there's another uh, story like this in the Gospel of John where a woman actually dumps the whole thing, a different woman, dumps the whole thing over Jesus' head and all this perfume flows down over his whole body and ticked off the disciples. And the reason it ticked off the disciples is because how much this perfume was worth. This perfume was very rare and expensive because the flower with which you made this perfume could only be collected high in the Himalayan mountains. So think about back then. Go all the way up there, gather these flowers, and make your way back uh, to make this perfume. Very, very expensive. In fact, uh, she had this perfume with her because it's, it acted like a savings account for her. She could carry it with her wherever she went and keep it safe. For some women, the one at the end of the Gospel of John, uh, that alabaster jar was actually the woman's dowry that she blew on Jesus right there. So you have a woman who any day of the week would not be welcome in this pastor's home because the pastor would not look kindly upon her. She shows up unannounced, uninvited, unwelcome, and she does this crazy stuff. She knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. So at this point, we want all of the children to kiss their parents' feet, if that's possible. No, we're not going to do that. All right. 
Well, let's just go on to the next screen. We won't uh, endure that. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Now, we don't know if this is some kind of weird mystical thing where he literally read his thoughts. And the reason why we don't know if we need to go there is because sometimes you can tell by somebody's facial expression what's going on, right? I got a hunch that this Pharisee uh, had all kinds of stuff written on his face that was all about, I can't stand this woman, I can't believe this is happening. How did she get in here? How do we get her out of here? That's what's on this Pharisee's mind. Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? And Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Now, just stop here for a moment. This is to point out something obvious. It wasn't that the Pharisee had sinned so much less. Because in the grand scheme of things, we all pretty much sin just as much as the next person. Deal with that. The person you think you're way ahead of, your head and shoulders better than, you're just the same. <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, when you're at a 50,000 foot view, you look just like an ant, just like they do. You're no better or worse than anybody else. The difference here is, this woman was in touch with that. And she knew what a gift it was to be in the presence of God, sensed through Jesus. And the Pharisee did not. The Pharisee was full of himself, was not in touch with the reality that he was a human being uh, that was broken and that it was a gift to be in the presence of this Jesus. And so that's why he didn't show much courtesy whatsoever. But Jesus reminds us, a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? Now, I wonder if I use the wrong inflection here. Because the first time I read this, uh, I read it like this. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. As if Jesus is making a pronouncement right then and there. Your sins are forgiven. But here's the thing. She already knows that. She already knows that because she's already been doing all of this expression of thanksgiving to Jesus. So I think it's more like a validation. I think that whatever experience that she had with Jesus before this that so moved her to take the risk to show up at this dinner party with her alabaster jar, then go weeping over her feet, over his feet, wiping it with her and anointing his feet with that same oil. I wonder if that was such a powerful moment that Jesus is just validating what she already came to believe. And maybe the inflection is, well, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> You're right. Your sins are forgiven. You nailed it. You figured it out. Now, the men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? Because that was something only God could do. Or perhaps the high priest in Jerusalem would be able to pronounce it over you. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So the reason I wanted you to have a peculiar cup before you today that smells good is because I, wa I want you to remember the aroma that would have been in the room that day. I don't want you to drink it just yet. Just smell it again. And let's go to the next slide, because I have some questions for you. I want you to just take a minute or two, maybe three, and answer these questions. Who is a person in your life who makes you feel completely welcome, valued, comfortable, warts and all? In other words, 
you can you can wake up first thing in the morning and they don't care that you haven't brushed your hair or your teeth or whatever. They know all your baggage and they love you and welcome you anyway. That, that kind of a person who you can truly just be yourself. Who is a person in your life who makes you feel comfortable and welcome that way? And then the question after that is, when was the last time you thanked them for it? So we have some background music for you to do just a little bit of table talk. Do that. I'll be back with you in like three minutes. Yeah, one more minute. it up and here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to grab your glass and uh, we're going to raise a toast to that person uh, in your life who allows you to be who you are. Maybe it's a good friend, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's a sibling, uh, we're not sure who that is. And as you do, uh, I'm going to have you notice two things. One, notice that this also represents the tone of Jesus, that that's why we're here today, why we feel like there's a good reason for us to be hopeful is because in Jesus, like in this story, we see one who welcomes everybody. You are welcome in the presence of God. The face of God is graceful and welcoming. And then as you taste this, as it goes down, you're going to notice uh, that it doesn't just taste like regular old tea, which it is, but it should taste just a little bit salty because tears are salty. And I want you to remember the tears. So smell it, drink it in honor of the person who honored you. <laughs> it is a little gross. You're right. <laughs> and then a challenge. I'm going to give you three different challenges today. Challenge one is this. Before 12 o'clock today, before 12 o'clock today, if you haven't already, do something to communicate to that person who you talked about or who you're thinking of and let them know that, you, that you're grateful for them. Can you do that? If it's a text message, email, whatever, uh, before 12 o'clock today. Got it? All right. To get you ready for the next uh, movement, the next story, we have just a brief video to warm you up.
clap for the Thanksgiving chair. <laughs> I didn't think about how funny it was until some of the kids started laughing at it. <laughs> I don't know where that chair get there. Well, that's the, th the Thanksgiving chair is what that's all about. And I wanted to share that video with you to launch us into the next story, which is about the U-turn. So we've talked about sweet water, which is a, an old term for perfume. Now we're going to talk about the U-turn, which explains the shape of your communion cracker today. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. So first, a quick geography lesson. Behold, this is the country of Israel. The top part of Israel is called uh, the region of Galilee. This is where Jesus grew up. In this middle band area, you have what we would call Samaria. It was a very uh, hated uh, region within the country. Uh, a lot of divisiveness between uh, Jewish people and Samaritan people. And below, well, this is where the city of Jerusalem would be. This is the southern part of the country. So Jesus is starting up here. This is where he grew up, where he did most of his ministry. And he's moving on down. Uh, and he's at the border here between Galilee, the region of Galilee, and Samaria here. And that's where we show up with him. It's very important that you know that. So he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten lepers stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now the reason you need to know um, that it's worded this way is because it's exactly correct. Uh, so you've got people who are at a distance shouting from Jesus. They're not rushing him like he's a rock star or something. And they can't do that because they are by law supposed to keep their distance. In fact, often uh, if you were just going along the road and lepers uh, saw you coming, they'd ring a bell and say, leper, 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 something like that, so you would know not to veer off track and find yourself in the camp. If you ever got leprosy or any other kind of skin condition, you would have to go to the leper colony away from everybody else because everybody else wanted you to stay away. You were ostracized by virtue of this thing that happened to you. And if this thing happened to you, people would naturally assume that God did this to you. What did you do to make God do that? And a lot of times, even today, people ask that question. People get this injury, they get a back deal, they get cancer, whatever, and they wonder, what did I do to deserve this? Why is God doing this to me? Well, God isn't doing this to you. But we feel ostracized nonetheless. So Jesus is walking along and comes across this encampment, and they have the audacity to ask for mercy. So that tells us that by this time in Jesus' ministry, he was well known as a, as a, a miracle worker. Some third-party sources, when they do a history on Jesus and they mention him as a historical person, they'll call him a magician because he was able to do healings uh, types of things. So that's what we have here. We have a, a group of 10 people in a leper colony. They're crying out from a distance. They see that it's Jesus. Have mercy on us, they cry out. And he looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Now, let me tell you something interesting about this. Um, Jesus knows that they're going to be healed as they go to the priests. He knows that that is going to cause a bit of a ruckus. He knows it's going to cause a bit of a ruckus, first of all, because now you've got ten guys who are very excited to be leprosy-free. And they're going to be beside themselves with joy. They're just going to be going nuts. I mean, can you imagine if all of a sudden you got this clean bill of health? and You can go back to your families. You can go back to your kids, your spouse, whatever, your life. Now you're, you're, like, you're like alive again. You're born again, literally. And so they're very excited about that. But he knew that as soon as they got to the priests, it was going to really hit the fan. Because the priests would know that they have leprosy. And these people would go to them and say, hey, I've been cleansed of my leprosy, so you can sign off on me so I can do all the religious stuff and come back to church. And their question would be, how is it that you are cured of your leprosy? And they would say it was Jesus, and that would be very disturbing. Because according to the priests, <laughs> the only place God moves in this way is in the temple. And if God wasn't moving in the temple where they were, it meant that somebody let God out of the box. And that meant trouble for their power. And so it's a very interesting thing that happens just with one statement of Jesus, go show yourself to the priest, which was the, the way that you would enter back into to society. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. So on the next slide, we keep going. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. 
And he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. So Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Now the reason this is important, uh, what kind of guy was this? This man was a, a Samaritan. A Samaritan was hated by the Jewish people back then. Um, very interesting history. I won't go into the full details of it, but hundreds of years before this, there was a, a theological schism. And really it had to do with fundamentalism. Uh, the Samaritan people, uh, they wanted to be strict adherence to a limited Torah or a limited uh, set of scriptures. But others said, no, we think we need to add books like the prophets in there as part of our collection. And so it's interesting that the Samaritans themselves were the first ones to say, no, we need to keep it real tight. So they were the more conservative. But then over time, things changed. And the Samaritans uh, kind of intermarried with some other cultures, and that influenced their theological tradition. And all of a sudden, before you knew it, they were the liberal ones, and the rest of the uh, Israelites, uh, for the most part, were, were more conservative. So you have this big theological rift, and they can't stand each other. If you're a non-Samaritan, if you're a Jewish person, you looked at us as a Samaritan as a half-breed, and you didn't mind saying so. It was out loud. It was, so, so, it was socially okay to rip on Samaritans. So isn't it interesting that the one out of the ten <laughs> who chooses to do a U-turn to come back is a Samaritan? And isn't it interesting that Jesus says to the Samaritan, <laughs> your faith has saved you. When he's got the wrong faith. And then that's what a provocative story. I mean, that, that's the beauty of the story. And Luke is giving that to us because that's what Luke loves to do in his gospel remembrance of Jesus. As you see more stuff happening with women, children, orphans, widows, and Samaritans and foreigners in Luke's gospel than any of the others. Because Luke wants to make it ultra clear that God is for the people who feel ostracized, who feel belittled by their gender, by their age, by their nationality, by their past. Luke is saying as loud as he can, God really, really, really does love you. And the only one who had faith enough to come back and do the U-turn was that Samaritan. So my questions for you around the table, which is why we have the U-turn cookie. That's what this thing is all about. It's actually a little, little cracker, biscuity kind of thing. Uh, I want you to answer the question. This is related to that Thanksgiving chair thing we looked at, is when is it easiest for you to remember to say thanks? When is it most difficult? And then the challenge question for you is when will you choose to take a moment for gratitude each day this week that you usually do not? So what I mean by that is, if it's very easy for you to say thanks before you take a bite of your dinner each night. Okay, well, keep doing that. But is there a time of your day when you rarely say thanks? And maybe in that moment you can. And what I want you to recognize is a Samaritan. We don't know how far down the, the pike he got. Uh, was it 100 yards? Was it a mile? Was it five miles? When he finally figured out, I think I'm going to turn back around. It was with intentionality. It was an inconvenience. He wanted to get home as much as everybody else. But he chose to take the time to go back and say thanks because he just had to. So take a moment and table talk. When is it easy to say thanks? When is it difficult? And when are you going to build some thanksgiving into your life? Go for it.
right, get about one more minute. One minute. So what I'd like you to do now is uh, grab that U-turn cookie or cracker, biscuit, baked good. And I want you to think about not just when it's easy for you to say thanks, but I want to have you think about committing to a, a moment uh, this coming week, maybe a daily thing, uh, when you generally are not particularly thankful. Uh, maybe it's just when you get out of bed. Uh, maybe it's Maybe it's doing a chore uh, at the house. Maybe it's doing dishes. Maybe it's cleaning the house. Maybe it's a meeting you hate going to. And I just want to encourage you to try on gratitude right before you do that. Because I know what's going to happen if you do. I know that if you choose to go into that thing, that activity with gratitude, you are opening yourself up to the very Spirit of God. And the air in the room will change. At least it will for you. So in commemoration of the Samaritan, the guy with the wrong faith, whose faith made him well, <laughs> uh, may you take and eat uh, this remembrance of Thanksgiving. And to get you ready for the third story, another video. tradition. Before we carve the turkey, before we serve the rolls, everyone is asked, what are you most thankful for this year? We recall the brightest moments, the biggest wins. What if we remembered what we can't imagine not having? What if we said thank you for what we'd miss the most? For what we'd give first? To those who live without? What if we celebrated the God who loves us and gives us the gifts we take for granted? ones we'd be lost without. So we showed that uh, Thanksgiving dinner here a couple weeks ago, and I wanted to show it again for those of you who didn't catch it, uh, because it reminds us to pay attention to all the things that we take for granted uh, so easily in our Western world. And to that end, uh, we enter, en enter our final scene, our final vignette of Thanksgiving. Jesus entered Jericho, which is in the southern and, um, let's see, eastern portion of Israel, and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region. In other words, he was a very big deal, and he looked over lots of other tax collectors in that region. And he had become very rich, and the way he had become very rich was ripping people off. So if you worked as a tax collector, you were hired by the Roman government. He was an Israel guy, but he was hired by the Roman Empire to collect taxes. The thing was, nobody knew how much taxes Rome really wanted, except for Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus didn't have to tell you how much you really owed. He could put any number he could get from you. And that meant that he could totally rip you off, and you wouldn't know <laughs> if he was doing it or not. And if you refused to pay the taxes that he said you owed, it meant that you could be arrested, which was not a good thing uh, under the Roman Empire. So that's how he became very rich. By the way, do you think he was real popular with his uh, contemporaries? Oh, yeah, people loved him. Sure. Uh, so he'd become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. He was vertically challenged. 
So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. By this time in Jesus' ministry, he traveled with an entourage. Uh, he had lots of followers trucking along with him. Uh, everybody wanted to see him. He was quite famous uh, by this time, and uh, that's what was going on. So let's go on to the next slide. So when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. What an interesting thing for Jesus to do. How presumptuous of Jesus, <laughs> right? Did anybody stop you at Rayleigh's or Safeway or Lucky uh, sometime this week and see you and say, I must come to your house for Thanksgiving? Anybody do that? Probably not. Isn't this odd that Jesus would just do this? Uh, but that's what he does. He says, quick, come down. I, I, I got to be a guest in your house today. I think he's just thinking this guy's got to be something else. So Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. Now, why would this be a big deal for him? Nobody, nobody likes him, right? Nobody likes him. He's driving around on the fanciest camels money can buy, and he yeah, has some pretty sweet swag that he's walking around in, but nobody likes the guy, especially not religious people. They can't stand the guy. Nobody, he's not welcome anywhere except for with other tax collectors and the people he parties with, I guess. And so the fact that Jesus, a celebrity who God is so clearly on, wants to be with him, that's a very big deal. And so he's very excited and joyful, but the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. That's where we get about four and a half. Four times, by the way, as much as he ripped people off. That was a strict adherence to the Jewish law. If you really wanted to get specific about it, that's what you'd have to pay people back in restitution. And the fact that he's willing to give half of his wealth away to the poor, that just says that he's willing to go way beyond what he is supposed to do. He's going to give an offering in celebration of the gift of God that he's experienced in Jesus. And so in light of this action, not that he earned it in any way, but in light of his response of letting go of his money, his precious money, Jesus responded, salvation has surely come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who lost. So don't get this thing wrong. He's not saying, hey, good deal. Zacchaeus bought his way into the kingdom of God. That's not it. The point is this, Zacchaeus found himself in the kingdom of God. He found himself in the presence of God. And in the presence of God, the only nat natural, normal response is to do the right thing and to do the generous thing. That is the normal behavior of a true son of Abraham. I'm going to be ethical, I'm going to be just, and I'm going to be generous because I understand who God is and how God is looks at me. That's what's happening here. And so the table talk for you uh, on the next slide is pretty simple. Uh, in a broad sense, Zacchaeus chose to give back to people who had given to him, even begrudgingly. And so my question for you is, who has given to you that you might offer some expression of thanks toward? And what might that four times in terms of the restitution mean? Here's, here's what I'm saying. I have a hunch that there are some people in your life that were incredibly gracious to you, giving to you, uh, maybe way beyond your deserving and you know it. It's not like you owe them, but it's just that you recognize that that person, you know, they, they really did something for you. They really showed you grace and mercy. They really showed you welcome in some, in some way. I'm saying sometimes in our life, it's a totally appropriate thing to just celebrate that and to break the bank a little bit and do something special uh, for that person. So my challenge for you is as you're thinking about somebody who may have been this way for you, how can you do something extra special for them? And the final thing is what half would you be willing to gift to the poor this week? So I got an idea here. So, so far, you've got some marching orders. So far, by 12 o'clock today, you have to express to somebody who you haven't expressed yet to just how welcoming they've been for you. You've got to get that done by noon today, okay? You with me on that? And on the U-turn thing, uh, you've got to figure out uh, some moment during your days this week 
when you normally wouldn't be grateful, you're going to intentionally take a moment of thanks to get your head straight so that you're celebrating the good things that you have. So if your terrible thing you hate to do is doing dishes or, or cleaning your house, hey, in that moment, take 10 seconds and say, I have dishes to clean. I have water to clean them with. I have a house to clean. I have a toilet to clean. That means I have a toilet. <laughs> That's a good thing, right? And then this final thing, uh, here's, here's a twist. Not only do something special for somebody who's really been gracious toward you in a particularly powerful way, but this last piece, there's this new thing that started just a couple, three years ago called Give Back Tuesday or Giving Tuesday. You familiar with this? Uh, there's even a hashtag with it, right? So you know it's real. So on Tuesdays, the idea is that you give back and you support a charity or whatever. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to consider giving half of something of what you would normally have. Half of something to charity. And by charity, I don't mean Crosswalk General Fund for this one. But maybe our missions, because our missions, we're either supporting local food initiatives or global food initiatives, and no administrative cost is going to that. So it's a, it's a good thing for your buck. It goes very far. Uh, but if, if you're on the go and you forget about it and you don't know how to do the, the online giving or whatever, and you, you know, whatever, but you're going by, into a store and there's a Salvation Army bucket there, they do really good work with their money. Trust, you can trust them with their money. On Tuesday, I want you to do something about it. And maybe the half that you give is your Starbucks budget for a week. Maybe you're a latte a day type person. That's five bucks a day. So that means somewhere around $18 is half of what you would spend on Starbucks. I'm just asking you, for that particular day, as an expression of thanksgiving and joy, like Zacchaeus, I'm asking you to give back to the poor, either through our missions or Salvation Army, or if you've got something near and dear to your heart, but toward poverty. Do you think you can do that? Or, or maybe, maybe you're a toothpaste junkie and you go through six tubes of toothpaste a week. Wow. Uh, so whatever half of that is. Or maybe it's your dining out budget or your entertainment budget or your grocery budget. I don't, you figure that out. You, you think about how much you've been blessed with and decide how do you want to give back to people who don't have because you can make a difference in their lives. And we've seen that so much here at the church. And just, you know, another shout out, um, you know, we celebrate them a lot because they deserve it a lot. Uh, but our food pantry team did two amazing things in the last 10 days. They gave out, I don't know, what was the final number, 50-something? How many? We gave out 50 complete Thanksgiving dinners to families who really needed it uh, this year. That's awesome. So well done. We, uh, we brought Darlene Tremune out of retirement, out of food pantry retirement, <laughs> just to give leadership to that because not only did we do that thing, uh, but then we had our normal distribution uh, this past uh, Tuesday. And our team st uh, st stood up again and just continued to deliver the goods. And I don't know how many we did this week, how many... Uh, So 63 family units got about a week's worth of groceries this past week. That's awesome. So that's what I'm saying, man. I mean, you, you support that. You are supporting the need right here in Napa. And we've got just an amazing team that works tirelessly uh, to pull that off. So well done, uh, food pantry team. You just, you rock, man. You guys are just awesome. And you're well known for it. So that's my challenge for you. You got three homework assignments today, all to carry on this Thanksgiving because Actually, Advent, which is the Christmas season, doesn't start till next Sunday. So forget what the stores are saying. Christmas really doesn't start till next Sunday. We get a week off. And so think about Thanksgiving this week. Think about it in terms of that salty, sweet, aromatic drink you had. And think about how somebody uh, caused you to have tears of joy, perhaps, and let them know about it. Think about the U-turn cracker. And think about when this week when you're going down that track toward Grumpyville, <laughs> that you, you halt in your tracks, you decide to do a U-turn to gratitude because it's going to change everything. And then finally, how are you going to do something special for that someone? And how are you going to do something extravagant for the poor who need it? That's Thanksgiving. That's true sons of Abraham. That's a crosswalker. And we can do it. Let's pray together. So God, we are truly grateful this morning because every one of us can relate to every single character we saw in these stories. 
If we're honest enough uh, with ourselves, we can completely relate to the woman uh, who showed up at that dinner. And if there was a big long list of all the things that we've got wrong in our life, uh, that would be a long list indeed. And we are grateful that you are a God who welcomes us and loves us anyway and is with us even through it to help us learn from it, grow through it, and be uh, transformed into new people even because of it. And we relate to Zacchaeus, or, or let's talk about the leper first. We relate to that guy uh, because we get really busy and we're more often like the 9 out of 10 who are just too busy with our lives to stop and say thanks. Well, God, we commit today to be more like the Samaritan, uh, to make an intentional decision to stop in our tracks and be grateful, uh, even in unlikely circumstances and times this week, just to see what happens. And finally, God, like Zacchaeus, we recognize that there are people who have been especially giving to us, and we want to, we want to celebrate their giving by doing something special for them. So help us understand what that could look like. And for the poor in our world, God, because we've been blessed so much, help us do something generous toward them this Tuesday. We thank you that you've given us our lives, and our future, and our hope. Uh, we truly owe it to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.